welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I am Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest is Father Daniel McCarthy, OSB. A couple of books we're going to talk about from him are Come Into the Light and Listen to the Word, available from the Kansas Monks. You can check out their website. Mm -hmm. And great to have you here, Father. Thank you, Doug. And, uh, and uh, I appreciate you stopping by. People will remember maybe a while back that you were on with Father Mitch, yes. his program, and uh, you're a scholar, and you, where are you actually located? Uh, I mean, a lot of your books have things to do with people I dealing with Rome and in England, but you're mm -hmm. actually an American, you're a Kansas boy, right? <laughs> I'm a Kansas boy. And you haven't really gone far from home, though, right? In the sense of where your abbey is. Well, my heart is certainly there, right. and okay. my abbey is St. Benedict's Abbey in mm -hmm. Atchison, Kansas. Right. And I, uh, I work, mm -hmm. I teach liturgy at the Pontifical Liturgy Institute, in Rome at okay. Santo Anselmo. Now, is that run by the Benedictines it's, then? Is that uh, one yes. of their outreaches? Yes, okay. it is. Okay. Now, you've written several books. Now, you're, are you considered a Latin scholar? Would you consider yourself a Latin scholar? Um, my degree is in liturgy. Okay. In order to study the history and theology of liturgy, a person has to understand Latin, mm -hmm. the Latin language. The prayers are in Latin. The history is written in Latin. Mm -hmm. The whole thing occurred in Latin. Okay. N even if you celebrate liturgy all your life in the vernacular in English, the, to do the research, mm -hmm. the study, you have to have Latin. So when I went to Rome to study liturgy, I uh, started studying with Father Reginald Foster, the mm -hmm. papal Latinist. And I studied with him for, for uh, many years. And now I'm writing his books with mm -hmm. him on his method of mm -hmm. teaching the Latin language. The first of five is now available. Were you always interested in the aspect of writing? Or is that something that just came as an outreach to what you were teaching? I think I always wanted to teach, mm -hmm. but um, I would say my education there at Sant Anselmo, the Pontifical Liturgy Institute, was so mm -hmm. rich mm -hmm. that I, and I've spent enough time at it, I've reflected on it uh, for some bit now, and I've got things I want to say. Mm -hmm. And so writing is a way in which I can prolong mm -hmm. a discourse and make sort of complete statements. Now, the, the book I want to talk about first is Come Into the Light, yeah. Church Interiors for the Celebration of Liturgy. Now, you say the remote origins of this book lie in many a Sunday lunch at the family table of Nick and Millie, and how do you pronounce their last name? Tice. Tice in Troy, Kansas. It, Tell us how. Well, when I was a young monk and after I was ordained, then I... Uh, was eventually assigned to be pastor on the Pony Express Trail in Donovan County, Kansas. Mm -hmm. okay. And Troy, St. Charles Parish, was one of the three I, uh, I was pastor of. And um, after Sunday Mass, I would go to Nick and Millie Tice's house and we'd have lunch mm -hmm. every day. And I'd stay uh, every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I would stay there at length and we would just talk. And mm -hmm. we'd talk about anything and everything. Their daughter, uh, Margaret Stanton, Peggy, Peggy, she um, had a background in church ministry, okay. and so she was very well informed, and we, we, I really enjoyed our conversations. Mm -hmm. So it was those conversations that led me to think about how to arrange a church for the celebration of liturgy, mm -hmm. and I did a few things there in Donovan County that, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, have inspired me ever since and prompted are there different ways of arranging a church for liturgy? I mean, if the liturgy in theory is supposed to be, be the same universally, at least within reason, shouldn't the layout all be the same? Well, just think of St. Peter's Church in Basilica mm -hmm. in Rome. It has a different layout than the Lateran, mm -hmm. the, uh, the cathedral there in Rome, right. which has a different layout than St. Paul's outside the walls. Mm -hmm. And the history of those three basilicas in particular mm -hmm influencing one another and then influencing other churches is, is very rich. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are different ways to arrange churches. And even after the council, there were different arrangements proposed. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in the preface of the book, uh, there's a statement here that says, how appropriate it is that the scholarly yet practical work on bringing the liturgy to life should emerge from the monastic experience? <laughs> Well, you're going out into liturgy, into the churches, the, the parishes, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Why is that connected to the monastic experience, which seems to some degree otherworldly or not part of the regular culture? 
Well, we have 200 students at our weekday mass mm -hmm. at the Abbey. And so we're very well connected mm -hmm. uh, with the world and with people. I see, okay. But because we pray every day at my Abbey, we gather four times a day for common prayer. And because we do that, and then we go to meals and we have our recreation, mm -hmm. the conversation outside of liturgy enhances our celebration of the liturgy, mm -hmm. and we discuss it, we take it rather seriously. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you live with a person who is using the incense, you discuss the different mm -hmm. things, and then... Are you concerned, and has your experience been, and, and is part of this because you don't see people taking the liturgy seriously? Oh no, I think people do take the liturgy seriously. For us Benedictines, it's simply mm -hmm. part of our daily life. Right, but, but, but if you're out and about in parishes or different, mm -hmm. you've been in England, obviously, you yeah. were there for a period of time. In fact, your co-author is located there, right? Yes, we founded a liturgy institute there at Ealing Abbey mm -hmm. in West London. And that's James Leachman? Yes, James, okay. Father James Leachman. Father James, right, okay. Yes. So that's what I'm interested in, in the sense of, you say here, the authors lay emphasis on five insights of particular importance, and there's five insights. You want to go through what those five insights are? You've got nature, reclaiming space, the furniture, posture, and procession. Those were written by the uh, guy who wrote the preface to right, the book. Right, exactly. And so that's expressing some of his concerns. Okay, that you're addressing in this book. Um, that he discerned in our book. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say I set myself to address some little different concerns. Mm -hmm. So what did you... Those what, are the ones he found. So what, are the, what, are the, what were the major concerns that you were setting about looking into? Well, let me say just as a, a fundamental concern, mm -hmm. and this comes from our retired professor at Sant'Anselmo, Crispino Valenciano, father, uh, Monsignor Crispino Valenciano. The arrangement of a church for the celebration of liturgy is based on personal illumination, mm -hmm. ongoing maturation, and interpersonal communion. These are the three moments, these are the three personal graced human experiences. And personal illumination occurs in the sacrament of baptism, mm -hmm. celebrated at the font with the architecture of the baptistry surrounding it. Ongoing maturation is celebrated uh, with the word mm -hmm. of God proclaimed from the ambo in the hall of the church and the reflection on the Word of God, and even the prayers as a response to the Word of God. And then the third moment is interpersonal communion, of course, the mm -hmm. Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. celebrated at the altar with its ciborium or baldachin, on its dais mm -hmm. and its architectural surroundings. So these three graced human experiences are the foundation, I believe, mm -hmm of um, the arrangement of a church for the celebration of liturgy. Mm -hmm. And what does that have to do with how your father would prepare to go to Mass and lay out his clothes <laughs> the night before? Oh yeah, well the, it's so simple and this mm -hmm. is the way, even without thinking, we do this. They, they would walk down the hill in St. Joseph, Missouri, down the bluffs to Immaculate Conception Church. Mm -hmm. um, now it's a museum. Mm -hmm. And they would enter through its doors with the Twin Towers there and they would pause at the baptismal font and celebrate a memorial of their baptism. Mm -hmm. They would, with the baptismal water, they would bless themselves mm -hmm. and they would say their profession of faith in a short form, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so both the ritual and the profession make the memorial of our baptism. Now, now people do right. that as a matter of course, Catholics go in, and in fact, yes. on their way out many times they mm -hmm. do it. But I'm not sure most people realize that that's what they're doing in a sense, right? And that's why I think it's important to have the baptismal font there. Okay. And to have baptismal So there's a direct waters. connection there. <laughs> then people will understand. I see, okay. We, we do it all the time and without thinking, mm -hmm. and then when we reflect on it, the meaning becomes so clear mm -hmm. and so rich because mm -hmm. we do it all our lives long. <laughs> and if it's the baptismal water, well, then they were, the family would process down the aisle to, to where they were going to sit. Mm -hmm. And they would listen to the word. And that's part of the ongoing maturation in the Christian life. They'd hear the homily. 
and offer the prayers. And then uh, they would continue the procession from their home all the way up to the altar where they would share in communion. Mm -hmm. And then after receiving communion, we turn around. That's when the procession begins to return back to our daily lives. Mm -hmm. We pause for prayer and a blessing, dismissal. We pass by the baptismal water. We go back to our daily lives. This is the basic processional mm -hmm. movement of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book, you also have this targeted to different members of the church members, church building communities mm -hmm. can use. So actually utilizing the particular material you have in here. You also talk about the way you arrange the book, which kind of relates to how you also talked about the layout of the church. Right? Yes, that's right. And so you've got the illumination in the baptistry yeah. coming to personal enlightenment, coming to awareness and greater insights at the different stages of one's life. And that's what you deal with in the beginning of the book, having to do with the baptistry in chapters three, the, uh, the font itself. And then you move on later, as you indicate with the maturation. You also talk about the six dimensions. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me with that, the, the you dealt with initially was the sun's course throughout the day. Yes. I, I never, ever really thought about, I mean, and we talk about, you know, mm -hmm. which should be facing east, et cetera, and, and those looking, but the idea in relation to the sun, is that connected to that or? What is, what is your sense well, of the movement of the sun in relation to the liturgy? Well, where, where does the sun rise? Mm -hmm. and in the east, of course. You just mentioned facing east, right. but actually it's facing the sunrise. Mm -hmm. That's the origin. In the Latin, oriens, ad orientem, it means toward the sunrise. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is originally associated with the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, the movement of the sun from its rising to its setting establishes one long axis for mm -hmm. the whole day and for a church even. The midday sun shining across the church establishes the cross axis of a church and the height of the midday sun reflected in the height of the building mm -hmm. and its opposite below on the floor establishes the vertical axis of a church, the third axis. Mm -hmm. And then the movement of the sun itself in time is the fourth dimension of a church and it can structure uh, processions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting because again, those are the kinds of things that I, I'm not sure most people walking around their local parish is, is connecting to. So it's interesting that there's these aspects behind it that at least in your mind should be there even if maybe they haven't always been there. Well, they can be developed. If you use uh, uniform lighting in a church, you're perhaps not going to notice all of this. Right. But if a church is well designed, then the natural lighting is going to enter into the church and will make a difference throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Now you go on, on chapter 16, you talk about you know, re that chapter reclaims the presider's chair as the chair of the teacher and the place for the homily because the ambo is rightly reserved for the proclamation of the scripture. Why don't you pull that apart from us when we say re reclaiming the presider's chair and also the difference between referring to something as an ambo or just not like a lectern. Well, I'd like to tell you the difference, explain it mm -hmm. for a moment. A lectern hold, it has a function. It holds a book. Of course, it's the lectionary and it's the word of God we're proclaiming from it. It's rather important, but it still is a functional mm -hmm. piece of furniture. An ambo has a symbolic structure that a lectern doesn't have. And the easiest way I can explain it to you, uh, I have to sing though, and I've never sung on air before. Okay. But Easter Sunday evening at Vespers, the first antiphon in the monastic tradition, as we sing it in Atchison, Kansas. The angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away and sat on it. Alleluia, alleluia. What did the angel say early in the morning on the third day on Easter Sunday morning? Mm -hmm. The angel said, he's risen. He's not here. To whom did the angel say it? to the women who are bringing the myrrh and right. the spices, the myrrh-bearing women. They had lost everything in this tragic death of Christ. And they came 
in their desperation to offer one last act of compassion. Right, anointing. Basically. Anointing, right. anointing the body. And the angel encountered them, rolled the stone away, sat on it, and said, he's not here. And the angel told the women, go and tell the disciples. An ambo is where we fulfill that command of the angel. Hmm. It is a monument of the empty tomb from which we tell the disciples, we proclaim the good news. And all scripture proclaimed from the ambo is interpreted in light of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Now, there used to be at one time, in some churches, a dual ambo. And now is there, and sometimes they still just, but where sometimes the singer would sing or a leader of song versus one ambo, but you're really supposed to use, has that changed or is that a design change, a liturgical change? Well, we're talking about different things. Right. Um, you're talking after the council. Right. When they said, let's face the people, mm -hmm. and they put an altar forward, and from the gospel side of the altar, they put a lectern. Okay, right. They called it an ambo. Ambo, but. And from the epistle side, they put a lectern. May have called it an ambo, I don't know. Right. And proclaimed the scriptures. Right. And then uh, as time went on, I think the two of them uh, developed into one. Okay. And a lot of parishes just had one and okay. put the chair on the other side or... Or now sometimes the musician sings the psalm there. Right. Those don't have the symbolic structure of an ambo. Okay, that's why I was wondering. The that's empty why. tomb. Okay. Now, there are ancient churches in Rome that have preserved their medieval ambos. Mm -hmm. And they have different lo uh, balconies mm -hmm. for proclaiming the gospel and for proclaiming the epistle. I see. And now, after Vatican II, we also have the Old Testament reading. Right. We have right. three readings on Sunday. So we haven't developed yet a more complex uh, system. A triple tier? Yeah, yeah. we haven't developed. <laughs> I haven't yet. quite gone there. You also, in chapter 21 in the book, you say, uh, unmask the modern tendency to place the altar in the geographic center of the church, yeah. centered under its dome or crossing. In contrast, the Roman Basilica is at a Lateran. St. Paul's outside the wall still preserve altars that are off-centered toward the nave, not centered under the crossing or located at the entrance of the apse. So the fact that you'd refer to unmasking the modern tendency would lead me to think that you have concerns about that practice. Well, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, people think the altar's in the very center under the dome, but it's not. Mm. It's set back ever so much so that a line from the center of the dome passes directly in front of the altar and the baldachin as well, down into the lower level where the tomb of the apostle is. Okay. This vertical axis of the church is left empty and free in St. Peter's, even though the altar is so close to the center. The vertical axis is a place in which we can express our self-transcendence from a former way of life into a new communion. Mm -hmm. There, St. Peter transcended this earthly life to join the heavenly communion. There's an expression of it. Or in marriage, if marriage vows are exchanged on such an axis, vertical axis of the church, mm -hmm. they express how both members leave behind, they transcend their former way of life in order to enter into a new communion. Mm -hmm. Monastic profession can happen here in which I also transcend my former mm -hmm. way of life to join this new communion in the monastic life. Mm -hmm. So the, after the council, very many churches put the altar in the geographic center of the crossing or under the dome, and it now occupies that vertical axis. Mm -hmm. And you can't exchange your vows there. You can't make profession there. It, the, the church loses some of the dynamic that's preserved when you have two distinct places for yeah. ritual activity, even if they're closely related. Yeah, because I think a lot of people just thought in terms of, oh, they put it in the center there because it's the people that way can sit closer to the altar. And... Which is a great value. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they do at St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. St. Paul has said the walls and the Lateran, uh, the altar. The thing that surprised me when I went there to Rome to mm -hmm. study, I thought that the altar in those two basilicas would be at the head of the apse, mm -hmm. the beginning of the apse you know, the rounded end at, the, right, at right. the head of the church, but it isn't. They're opposite 
at the head of the nave. Mm. So there's the whole nave with the triumphal arch, and just beyond the triumphal arch, immediately, is the altar. Mm -hmm. And then there's some distance across the, uh, the, the transept, the transversal nave, if you will, before you get to the apse. And the apse can be rather prolonged as well. Right. Now you've got a, a, a fair amount of illustrations and, and that, yeah. that that'll help people going through the book to, to better understand exactly what we're talking about and you're talking about in, in Coming to the Light. Just before we go, there's also a book called Listen to the Word Commentaries on opening, on selected opening prayers. What I found interesting about this book, and it, was this based on a series of articles that you were yes. writing? Was that for the tablet? Yes, and you remember when the new translation of the Roman Missal came out. Right. This was a preparation for that new translation. And the editor of the tablet, Catherine Pepinster, was eager to allow me a full page every week mm -hmm. for five years to write commentaries on the different prayers of the Mass. Mm -hmm. And so I have about 250 commentaries. So if you want to study the prayers of the Mass, mm -hmm. reflect on them. Here, uh, these commentaries I wrote on the Latin texts mm -hmm. of the prayers, not on the English not translations. Not on the translations themselves. Although the translations are there, the old translations are in mm -hmm. this book. So you can get a new missal and read the new translations, but the commentaries are still good. Right. What's interesting about this is the fact that you're talking about valuing the opening prayer, I yeah. guess, the collect. <laughs> you know, a lot of people kind of miss it in many times yes. and don't, and, which is what you're trying to point out. There's an important prayer that's opening the Mass. I mean, how is that particular prayer? We all know the epistle in the Old Testament yes. reading. There's a connection there, and obviously there's mm -hmm. the gospel, which the homily is usually based at least mostly on that, if not some of the other readings. These other prayers that are there, mm -hmm. most of the rest of the Mass, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, the canon itself, which, you know, there's variations, but it's basically the same, the Agnes Dei, other. But these other prayers change yes. at each Mass, don't they? They change at each Mass, each week, mm -hmm. and, but they're repeated every year. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Scripture are on a two or three week, uh, two or three year cycle, mm -hmm. um, the prayers are annual. The task of the opening prayer is to name this assembly as the body of Christ in some way, and it does. It'll say, you're faithful, you're devout, you're people gathered, people whom you've called, you're elect. It'll name this assembly as the body of Christ, and it will name our greatest hope, our desire, our greatest articulation of our desire for fulfillment. That's named in the collect. Mm -hmm. The prayer over the gifts just before the Eucharistic prayer, has to do with an exchange of gifts. We offer bread and wine with a gift for those in need, mm -hmm. and we offer our very selves. Right. And God gives us the body and blood of Christ, and we become evermore the body of Christ. So there's an exchange, divine mm -hmm. human exchange that's reciprocal. After communion, the task of those prayers I've discerned is to reflect back on the communion we have just shared and to look forward to our daily life the rest of the week. Right, because there's that prayer that after communion yes. that a lot of times, again, unless you happen to have a missile or you're paying attention, you might not even know that's there. Well, let me ask you, because obviously the readings come out of Scripture, yes. okay, in one form or another. These prayers, are these prayers that were recently written? Are these historical prayers? Where did these prayers that populate the, the collect, the opening, where do they actually come from? Well, being a professor now at the Pontifical Institute of Liturgy, before uh, it was named as a teaching institute, there was a research institute there at San Anselmo. And the, the, uh, the scholars did the research on the early Roman sacramentaries. Okay. The Verona collection of mass booklets the papal sacramentaries from the seventh century and following, the Roman parish sacramentary, the Gelasian, used in the, in the, the parochial liturgy in Rome. Right. And these two different traditions, the papal and the parochial liturgy, parish in Rome, they were, con they were confused in the eighth century in north of the Alps. And then over time, there were lots of changes and a lot of history involved. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the prayer for this last Sunday 
is from the papal sacramentary of the seventh century. Mm -hmm. So when they revised the prayers after the Second Vatican Council, the very people who were working on these revisions had done the scholarship before mm -hmm. the council on these ancient Roman sacramentaries. What I found astonishing is that some of these prayers are found only once in all manuscripts, only once, mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful prayer. Yeah. And it took a scholar to remember, oh, I remember this beautiful prayer from this papal sacramentary, and we're going to use that right. for this Sunday because it fits so perfectly. Right. Well, thank you very much, Father. Obviously, yeah. you've got several other books here. Uh, People can check out your website to find out more about it, and we appreciate you being here so thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, you bring a peace to EW10. It's always good oh, to have a monk or, or a Benedictine here praying with us and praying for us. Father Daniel McCarthy, OSB, come into the light and also listen to the word available from www.kansasmonks.org. And this has been EW10's bookmark. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Doug Keck. See you next time. Mm -hmm.